When gardeners are thinking of growing tree fruit, one of the first species they think of is apples. Let's start with an overview of apple culture. We will spend more time on apples than other tree fruit as they are often one of the first tree fruit gardeners think of and they require a more challenging care regime. We can control the size of apple trees by using dwarfing rootstocks. Remember that apples are vegetatively propagated by grafting or budding. The top part of vegetatively propagated tree is called a scion and is desired apple, such as Honeycrisp or Jonathan. The bottom part is the rootstock and is chosen for its dwarfing ability as well as other characteristics such as resistance to suckering. Dwarf trees are usually 8 to 10 feet tall, semi-dwarf 12 to 15 feet tall, and standard trees 18 to 25 feet tall. The size of the apple fruit, whether grown on dwarf, semi-dwarf, or standard, are the same. Dwarf trees are not recommended for Kansas unless given support as our strong winds will often snap the trees off at the graft. Semi-dwarf trees are better able to withstand our Kansas conditions. Dwarfing rootstocks not only keep the trees smaller, but also reduces the number of years to fruiting after the trees are transplanted. Dwarf trees usually take three to four years, semi-dwarves four to five years, and standards five to seven. Pear trees take longer to bear than other commonly grown tree fruit. Remember that apples require cross-pollination. In other words, two different varieties of apple are needed to get a full fruit load. There are exceptions. For example, Golden Delicious does not need a pollinator to bear a full fruit load. Sometimes people wonder if crab apples will pollinate fruiting apples. The answer is yes, but only if they bloom at the same time. Crab apples are often bred to bloom early. Thinning fruit is important for a number of reasons. Normally, we want to thin apples to about one every six to eight inches. The branch in the middle of this photo has too many apples, but the one on the left is more balanced. So why thin fruit? What does it do for us? If a tree has too many apples, the apples will be small due to competition for the sugars the tree is able to produce. Thinning to an apple every six to eight inches allows fruit to reach full size and have all the sugars needed to be top quality with some energy left over. That does not mean that there has to be a minimum of six to eight inches between each fruit, but on average, the apples should be six to eight inches apart. What you're really after is a certain number of leaves per fruit. Remember that apples already on the tree have priority for energy at the expense of fruit buds for next year's fruit crop. If there are too many apples, then no fruit buds are formed for next year's crop. If there are no fruit buds, then there are no apples the next year. Since there are no apples that next year, then there is lots of energy to make fruit buds. The apple grower ends up with a cycle in which you have a very large apple crop one year and none the next. We call this biennial bearing. Too many apples can result in too much weight for a branch to bear and limbs may break. Thinning apples reduces weight. Pruning also removes potential apple fruit and can help prevent damage to the tree. Shortening limbs by pruning can concentrate the fruit closer to the trunk, which helps reduce limb breakage due to less leverage. Let's look at thinning in more detail. Apples are known by the number five. There are five fruit per cluster, five seeds in an apple, and five petals on the flower. Five fruit per cluster is way too many. We need to remove all of those but one. Pick the nicest, largest fruit or remove all others. This means you'll likely be removing perfectly good fruit. That's okay. It needs to be done. This is a photo of an apple branch before thinning. The next photo will show how many apples should be removed and how many should be left. So this is the apple branch after thinning. Notice that more apples are removed than are left on a tree. This can be difficult to do, but it's necessary if high quality fruit is your goal. Training and pruning apples is necessary if the trees remain healthy and productive. Many gardeners are afraid they will ruin their trees because they don't know how to prune. Pruning is not difficult once you understand the principles. Pruning is light work and pruning puts fruit in better light. Actually, pruning is light work if you prune every year. If you neglect pruning for several years, it is no longer light work, but can become a very difficult task. Putting fruit in better light is also important. Apples need sunlight to color well. 
If you place an apple that should turn red in a bag so sunlight doesn't hit it, it will never turn red. So why would you put an apple in a bag while it's still on a tree? This is actually one of the ways to protect apple fruit from disease and insect damage. We talked about bagging fruit in the previous lesson. Other benefits of pruning include a number of things. Pruning when trees are young can help develop a strong tree structure so trees can bear heavy fruit loads without breaking branches. Pruning also decreases the humidity inside the tree canopy. This can help reduce diseases as high humidity encourages disease development. Deciding what to prune can also help control tree size. Smaller trees are easier to prune, spray, and harvest. Dwarfing rootstocks can be a great help in this, but pruning can be very valuable as well. Pruning improves fruit quality by removing excess fruit, which improves air movement and sunlight penetration, both of which are necessary for high quality fruit. Training young trees is often overlooked and yet is vital in developing a strong and productive tree. We may not prune much at all the first year, especially if the tree has already started to form branches. We want to keep as many leaves as possible so there is plenty of energy to help establish the tree. However, often mail order trees are whips. Whips are trees without side branches. Prune these back to three feet tall to encourage the formation of side branches. Now let's look at some general principles. The year following planting, remove all branches that are lower than 18 inches. This will give enough room to work under the tree. Next, choose four to six scaffold limbs that are well distributed around the tree. Well distributed limbs are important so that the fruit load is balanced once the tree matures. Next, make sure the four to six scaffold limbs are attached at a wide angle. Remove all side branches other than those chosen to be scaffold branches. Let's look at why branches attached at a wide angle are important. This photo shows branches attached at a weak angle. We want a wider and stronger angle for our fruit trees. Let me show you why. The photo on the left is a strong angle and that on the right is weak. To illustrate the difference in strength, we'll cut each of these branch attachments in two longitudinally and flip them over so you can see the difference. Look at the weak attachment. Notice that bark has been caught between the two branches. It will not take very much weight on one side or the other to break the attachment. The strong attachment does not have the problem with bark caught between the two branches. As a matter of fact, fibers from the two branches are interlaced with one another, making the attachment very strong. This is an example of a tree broken apart. Strong angles and proper crooning can help prevent this type of damage. This is an example of a perfect little tree after pruning. Very little was taken off, just a couple of branches were removed. Notice the wide angles and the distribution of limbs around the tree. Let's look at some general recommendations for pruning fruit trees first. So when do you prune? I usually tell homeowners to prune during March. You actually can prune earlier, and commercial people do, but March is usually more comfortable for the one doing the pruning. Always prune back to another branch, never leave a stub. A stub can act as an entry point for disease. Also, don't cut back flush to the branch, but only cut back to the collar. In this photo, you can see the collar right here. If you cut flush to the branch, the wound will be much larger and will take longer to heal. On this branch, your cut will be made right here. Now let's look at a list of priorities in pruning. What is most important to take out first and when do you stop? First, take out any dead, broken, damaged, or diseased branches. Next, take out suckers and water sprouts. Let me show you what suckers and water sprouts are. Suckers come to the base of the tree or from roots. They come from the rootstock and therefore will not produce good fruit if allowed to develop. They must be removed. Water sprouts come from the branches or trunk and grow straight up. Trees that are over pruned often produce an abundance of water sprouts. They make excellent sign wood if you're going to do grafting, but normally they should be removed. It is better to remove these during the growing season, but can be removed in the spring. Now that the water sprouts and suckers are gone, we need to start making decisions. If two branches cross and rub, one has to be taken out. 
If any branch is too low, it should be removed. If two branches form a narrow angle, one should be eliminated. The last step is do a general thinning, beginning with branches that point toward the interior of the tree. Your goal is to thin enough so you can throw a softball through the tree. Stop pruning when you have removed 30% of the tree total, even if that's not quite enough. Deadwood and suckers don't count in the 30%. The next two slides show a before and after example of pruning. This is before pruning. Notice the branches that are growing down and how cluttered the interior of the tree is. This is after pruning. This tree wasn't in bad shape and that a significant amount of material had to be removed. So what about neglected trees? How do you prune something like this? The smart thing to do is make one pruning cut at ground level and start over with a new tree. However, let's say this is a tree on grandpa's farm and you do anything to bring it back. How do you do it? First recognize that this will be, take several years. Remember you should never take out more than 30% of the tree in one year. The mistake most people make is to prune a little here and a little there. Rather start with the big stuff. Take out any big branches that are dead, broken, diseased, or are weakly attached. Do not use tree paint on the wounds. They don't help and actually slow down healing in many cases. Try to bring the tree back to four to six major scaffold limbs. You'll likely hit your 30% at this point. Now the fun begins as the tree is going to react to this level of severe pruning. It's going to produce water sprouts and will likely produce suckers. These should be removed during the growing season. If they are, you can keep the reappearance of suckers and water sprouts the following year to a minimum. This is what makes bringing back a neglected tree so difficult. The next spring, try to reduce the height of the tree by cutting taller branches back to a shorter offshoot. This will make the tree easier to care for. The tree will again react by sending up water sprouts and suckers. Remove them during the growing season. This is an example of reducing the height of the tree. This, of course, is the before photo. This is the after photo. The tree still needs some work, but will be much easier to care for. This is what you want, improved structure and eventually a healthy, bearing tree. Spreading limbs is a concept you may not be familiar with. There are a couple of reasons that spreading limbs is an important practice. First, it makes the light branches stronger. Remember we said wide angles are stronger than narrow ones. We can increase the angle of a branch attachment by using spreaders. Spreading also makes the tree bear sooner. Making a tree more horizontal changes the hormone balance resulting in quicker bearing. We're looking for approximately a 60 degree angle to the trunk. This is a method commonly used on very young trees for spreading the scaffold limbs. A clothespin is used to put a little downward pressure on the young side branches. For more mature trees, we can use other types of spreaders. In this photo, we have plastic spreaders that are colored orange and wooden spreaders. The wooden spreaders have a nail pounded into each end. The head is then removed and the point sharpened. This sharpened nail can then be pushed into the trunk and into the branch to be spread. This allows the branch to move with the wind without loosening the spreader. Though pushing the point of the nail into the tree is an injury, harm to the tree is negligible and wounds heal quickly after the spreader is removed. The plastic spreaders also have sharpened points and work just like the wooden ones. Try to bend limbs 45 to 60 degrees from vertical. Spreaders are normally left in a tree for one growing season. This is a close-up of the two types of spreaders. The wooden is a miniature version of what was seen in a previous photo, and the plastic one is the same as what you saw in that photo as well. Notice that both have sharp points that can be pushed into the bark of the tree to keep the spreaders from slipping. The most common apple diseases we see in Kansas are apple scab and cedar apple rust. Fire blight and powdery mildew may also be problems in certain years. See our common plant problem webpage on these diseases for current recommendations. The insect that most likely to attack the apples is the codling moth. Its larva is the worm in the apple. Let's look at each of these in more detail. Apple scab is most common early in the season. 
Spray with a product containing microbutanil during April and May at a 7 to 10 day interval. Though Captan also controls scab, it does not work well on cedar apple rust, but products with microbutanil work very well on both and therefore is recommended. Look at our webpage on Apple Scab under Common Plant and Pest Problems to find the trade names of products that contain microbutanil. Cedar apple rust is a more severe problem on apples than scab for most Kansans. It is a disease that must go back and forth between junipers and apple or crab apple. The photo on your left shows cedar apple rust gall on juniper when it is blooming. Blooming means the gall is releasing spores. The cedar apple rust blooms only during April and May and only during wet weather. Remember we said that this disease must go back and forth between junipers and apples or crab apples. That means the spores from the juniper can only infect apple. They cannot reinfect juniper. You can see an apple leaf with cedar apple rust in the photo on the right. Spores from the apple can only infect juniper. They cannot reinfect apple. Therefore, if either junipers or apples are not present, the disease dies out. However, in Kansas, junipers are so common they cannot be eliminated. Spores can also be carried by the wind for long distances. Junipers up to a half to two miles away can still infect an apple. Use microbutanil during April and May to control cedar apple rust. Spray at a seven to 10 day interval. The worm in the apple is a larval form of the codling moth. There are three generations a year and we often have to spray all season for good control. We have certain apples that are resistant to all the common apple diseases which are apple scab, cedar apple rust, fire blight, and powdery mildew. These include Liberty, Freedom, Williams Pride, and Enterprise. None of these would need to be sprayed for disease. However, the apples would still need to be protected from coddling moth through sprays or through bagging the fruit. Well, that covers apples. We'll cover all the other types of tree fruit in the next lesson.